So tonight we are on chapter 16, if I'm not mistaken, Understanding Spiritual Progression, and that picks up on page 275, if you have your book. Flip over here. So I want to start by asking a question. Um, whether you have children or don't have children or maybe grandchildren or whatever, and they are, your children are, are misbehaving or your child is misbehaving, okay? So <clears throat> what are some ways that we would try to intervene and stop the bad behavior, say, with a, with a child of ours or um, regardless of the age. It's just somebody that's either you're a guardian or a parent. You just want to intervene and stop some bad behavior going on, whatever it may be. What are some options that we have available to us? Pull them aside. Okay. So just okay. I'm just gonna make some notes here. Pull aside, and then then what did you say? And bring to their attention what you see wrong in their actions. Okay. Make them aware of what you're doing. All right. So talk to them. Depending on how old they are and how mature they are. Where'd I sit my little cup? Oh, it's right here. It's all right. I get it. Yeah. <clears throat> dry. My throat's dry as a bone tonight. And it sounds like, uh, once again, going through puberty for the, four, <laughs> for the fourth time in this session, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So what are some other things? What are, what, just think. What are, what are some things we can do to try to change our child's behavior? Whether it's chronic, whether it's just a one-time event, is this the only thing available to us, or what do you think? Nobody wants to say beat it out of hand. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, corporal, <laughs> corporal punishment. Corporal punishment. Yeah. Again, it would be, any and all of these would be age appropriate, right? Um, Maybe grounding up, right? Grounding up. Okay, grounding. Okay. We'll take away uh, privileges. Um, anything else? Okay. Well, we we call that we can say bribe or or we could say what positive reinforcement or incentives. Let's, okay, we got some incentives going on here. Um. Uh, anything else that we might think of? We can. Uh, and it doesn't have to be your kids. It could be somebody else's kids. Or, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm saying that, you know, tell them that you love them, but you don't like their behavior, their actions, so that they know that they don't, you don't like them because, you know. Okay. Being, well, okay, that's close to talk to them, but we'll call it. Yeah. Not, you know. You're talking, you're reasoning with them. Okay. Um. Okay, I was, yeah, uh, and that can overlap with some of these. Counseling, and uh, in some cases, I guess you could say even psychiatry or psychology, if there's some sort of severe chronic behavior problem going on. Um, we redirect at school, we redirect. Redirect.
Yeah, how does redirect work? Is that where you try to redirect our attention? What? Yes, you redirect the bad attention to what you want them okay. to do by saying that they're going to do something that they don't want to do. And then you redirect them to what they do want to do. Okay. Or you give them, okay, if you do this, we have this, this, and this. Okay. When this is done, you do an if, when, and Okay. So, uh, so when dealing with kids like you know behavior kids or, or whatever emotional kids, we a lot of times at school you redirect. And if that doesn't work, then okay. we, we can take them and have, we have a room set up that will help redirect them, and that has calming stuff in there. And so okay. They can just they can communicate to you. Okay. What the emotion you're going okay. And that, that seems like you're separating them from the environment where they yeah. were they were at and all that. Okay. I don't know how you follow up. I've taken my children many a time to places where I let them observe the results of certain sins. Okay. Including funerals. Okay. See some young person that looked like they were 90 years old. That's a result of sin. Okay. I'm going to call that a field trip then. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think that's how it's kind of tied to talk to them. It kind of explains the consequences of what they're Yeah. This. Yeah. This is what's going to And it could be punishment. It could be it, just yeah. consequences of you know, reckless behavior or whatever. Yeah. I know I've seen documentaries before where they've taken troubled youth or uh, uh, whether you you know, can be incarcerated youth, and they'll take them to an adult prison. They'll show them, and that was free up to yeah, the things like that. Yeah, yeah. So that can have a profound effect at times. Which of these, <clears throat> and this is, you know, maybe it's just speculation or best guesses. Do which of these are are maybe best well suited for? Not just changing their behavior at that moment, but it but it can also change them over the long haul, over, over a period of time. Um, or, or are any of them suited for that? I, I don't know. So think about, you got bad behavior, we, we intervene in it, one or more of these that are going on. Uh, but, but if you think about it, oftentimes, say, a child is acting out, depending on the severity of what it is, we can you know, stop them. You can put them in time out. You can you maybe give a spanking even. Um, do, do, do the child, does the child then from then on out obey or do they, or you know, does it solve the problem permanently or do they sometimes um, you know, re-engage in the bad behavior? What do you, what do you, which, are any of these well suited? I don't know, what, and it's, there's not right and wrong, but to, to once you go through this, uh, it, it, it kind of is a permanent solution, or, or are these more or less temporary solutions? I don't know, what do you think? Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. Especially when you're dealing with age differences on this spectrum, everything is, is kind of honest. You've got an age spectrum, you've got the individualities that go go with each child. Um, it's really, I mean, the, you know, a lot of those are just changing their behavior, but you know, their immediate behavior. But probably to make the biggest difference to change change them is what there would be explaining the consequences. You know, ideally, mm -hmm. they're going to grow up and they're going to when all the other stuff's going to go away, where you're not going to, you know, yeah, give a spanking to your, you know. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and some, yeah, so like I said, sometimes things resolve themselves with, with age, with maturity, hopefully. Um, you know, some, uh, some things kind of go away. Uh, for some, you know, it may stay. For others, it could get worse even. Uh, it, it's hard to say, but but when you when we get to uh, the adults, so this this is over here. Let's just say child. Uh, 
and over here is adults. Um, now, adults misbehaving is a whole different story uh, because a lot of times adults misbehaving doesn't really get addressed and unless you get into breaking the law. Yeah, it can be addressed if the, if the misbehavior happens at their place of employment. Uh, yeah, things can be addressed at that level. Um, but it's, it's, it's far different from, from children. What about adults that, say, have severe behavior problems, acting out, doing things wrong? What are some ways, then, that that's addressed? How, yeah, how does society address address adults? The whether time out? <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll call it incarceration or jail, prison. Okay. Jail or prison. Um, any other things? Now that's involuntary, but there's isolation. isolation. Is that where just people isolate themselves from the bad person, no, or? You act bad enough, people just ain't gonna be around you. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's, that's what I was thinking too. But in addition to that, I think people move towards groups of people that share the hatred. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll say. Um, okay. So we'll put isolation up there, and then we have anything else? I guess you could say. Oh, this would be a voluntary thing. Uh, pe some people can seek help themselves. Maybe they'll see a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or we'll just say professional help. Um, the workforce determination. Okay, yeah. If it's employment, yeah, it could be, uh, I'll just put terminate employment. Which happens a lot with people who are addicted to drugs and other things because that spills over into the workplace a lot and so that will affect uh, employment. So, you know, some of these things can be a wake-up call to an individual for sure, but again we're wanting to look at how can a person's behavior be corrected more of a more of a, a long-term solution uh, rather than you know something that's a, just a temporary fix uh, and it's it's hard to really know sometimes what the, so right uh, you know these things are basic basically we're talking about secular means here I mean you could you could talk about people you know going to see a pastor or going to church or seeking you know uh, counseling from from a pastor. I think, but, unfortunately, for a lot of adults, once they finally end up changing their behavior, it's just fatigue. They just get, they just get old. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you think about, there's, there's probably, there's no telling how many womanized <coughs> 50 and 60 year olds are out there that would still love to be womanized, but they're just old and beat down and they can't do it anymore. <laughs> and it just, Okay. You finally just get to a point where you can't club every night. You can't go out and run around and, and gamble for four days straight. Okay. You just run your body in the ground. And it's not that they got better, they just got tired. Okay. So what you say physical limitations or something like that? Okay. So the reason that I'm kind of going through this little exercise here is that we want to talk about understanding spiritual progression. And in understanding spiritual progression, we have to think of, a, of this Christian concept. It's called uh, sanctification or progressive sanctification. So what do, you, what do you think I mean by that when I say progressive sanctification? Anything come to your mind? What do you think that means? Okay, becoming more and more Christ-like. That, that's a good way maturity. to do that. Maturity, spiritual maturity, okay, holiness, Christ-likeness, these sorts of things. 
And the thing is, there are, there are ways to affect changes in people's behavior, right? We can do what's called, you know, uh, in most of these cases, you can have what's called, you know, temporary fix or restraining the bad behavior. Um, some of these can be long-term, though, that they can involve long-term. But we want, when we think about people's behavior, uh, uh, let, let's say we want, we want people to be moral, right? Kind, nice, decent, considerate when it comes to others. Um, we can think of, you know, well, these kids aren't playing well together. You know, we're going to talk to them. We're going to reason with them, maybe spank them. Who knows? That's generally, a, that's generally a temporary thing because it doesn't permanently fix the behavior. Okay, it's a, and, and that's, sometimes that's the way it is over here, even with adults. I think sometimes that's the way we, the church, look at new Christians. We tend to treat them more like children than we do adults in the, in, in the way, that, in the sense that we expect them to adjust, adjust your behavior. This, is, this isn't the best behavior. Uh, you may be a new Christian, but we work on correcting your immediate behavior. Now, yeah, sometimes that's necessary. Uh, sometimes it is very, very necessary to use all of these. I guess, you know, if you see a kid holding a pair of scissors, like, uh, where's Joby at? Okay, so if Joby got a hold of a pair of scissors or Aspen, you know, we got to address that immediately. Okay, get that away, you know. Um, and so, and if the child knows better, sometimes a swat on the bottom is going to go along with it. Um, so we do have to, and if somebody's breaking the law, yeah, we have to adjudicate the case, and if they're guilty, send them to prison, isolate them. We have to, we have, to have that. And so these are uh, basically means of, of restraint. That's re it's restraining bad behavior, or it's restraining evil. And that's the major role that God has given governments. God has instituted government. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But it's to restrain evil. And it's to um, reward goodness, so to speak. So there's this measure of justice that God has um, uh, put into place for governments to exist. So it's to re major things restrain government, but also to praise and reward good. Now, when it comes to Christianity, you know, uh, we really want people to change their behavior, but we want it uh, to occur a little bit differently. It's, uh, it's not based on, you know, rewards and punishments, which is oftentimes what we see with a lot of stuff here. Uh, we want people to do the right thing because it's the right thing, uh, not to avoid a punishment or to receive a reward if they do the right thing. And so... What we have to look at are, uh, is the area of transformation. When it comes to Christianity, we want people to be transformed. And the way that's going to occur is from the inside out. To where these other things that I'm erasing, these are outside external constraints that work, from the, you know, work on the outside in, but... Uh, transformation works from the inside out. So I'm just going to put the word transform up here to think about this a minute. We, we want to see people uh, in, in the sanctification process of becoming more and more Christ-like. We want them to transform, right? We want them to change on the inside, what we call a heart change, a soul change, to change from the inside out, where they're now doing the right thing or the good thing, um, you know, because uh, they want to do it, okay? But we have, uh, we have problems as human beings in doing the right thing. Uh, you can go from birth uh, on up, and we are fallen, right? We come into this world as fallen people. Our fallen people, and so we're going to have these we're going to have these proclivities and these desires oftentimes to do <clears throat> things that we ought not to do. I'll put it that way, okay? 
We have these, uh, uh, and it's different with different people. People have different desires, uh, proclivities of, of whatever they're drawn to, and it makes it hard sometimes to do the right, to do the right thing. So this is sort of the process I want to talk about here, and it gets pretty deep sometimes. I'm going to try to keep it on a level, you know, that we can all, so that we can all understand what, what's going on here. Um, so, um, yeah, let me put up my little triangle here. It's, uh, it's in the book. So I've got this little triangle. And at the bottom we have beliefs. We'll be coming back to this. <clears throat> beliefs, values, <clears throat> and behaviors at the top. So for all of you. So we start with beliefs. So if we want to change behavior, we don't start with behavior. As far as if you want to change the person over the long haul. Like if they're misbehaving, saying, hey, stop that, uh, I'm going to spank you, or stop that, I'm going to fire you, or stop, th okay, that's changing behavior, you know, up here at this level. But generally speaking, in the Bible, the things generally, for the, what we call transforming on the inside out, to change behavior, we generally start down here. Because our beliefs, there's our beliefs, our beliefs, affect our values, and then our values and seriously influence our behaviors. Okay. Uh, now, we can go against it, but at times, we often do. It doesn't work perfectly. But oftentimes, our, our, our strongly held belief becomes a value, and the things that we value are oftentimes the things that we do. Right? So, if you held a belief that, say, attending church isn't important, it's not a value, it's going to affect your behavior whether or not you even go to church. It can, and the, so that's just an example. It can, you can put up a diff, million different examples on that. So we're going to come back to this in a little bit. So uh, yeah, there in Romans uh, chapter 12. Okay, has anybody got Romans 12 pulled up? I'm going to have to go into my Bible here. Okay, so he's talking about, Paul here is talking about, you know, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he gives the reason and purpose for that on that, so that you can know and the will of God. Now he's talking about, here in chapter 12, he's, he's actually talking about, um, I believe he's talking more about behavior than he is about doctrine. Generally, Paul and the other writers in the New Testament, they, they'll spend a good p first part of the, of the letter of the epistle talking about doctrine, and then the second part of it, they generally talk about how, how do we now uh, live out that doctrine? Uh, how, how should it affect our behavior and all of that? And so we want to look at our, at our beliefs and then uh, move, move, move our good beliefs to our values, and hopefully our values then are going to affect our behaviors. It's, you know, all of this stuff is easier said than done. So, let me move over here. Hopefully I'm not going to lose you guys. If I do, stop me. So, we have this problem as fallen human beings. We come into the world, okay, uh, fallen and corrupted, okay? It's called, known as the depravity of man, the doctrine of human depravity. So we have this, uh, in, 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 this intrinsic corruption to our human nature, which is reflected in we, we have these uh, desires and wants that are not the right thing, okay? And the temptation is pulling on us, and, and we uh, sooner or later we're going to have this lapse. We're going to we're going to give in and cave into that temptation. Uh, okay. Does anybody know what a feedback loop is? 
Sometimes it's called a death, death spiral. You ever heard of that term? Okay. Well, let me try to explain it. So we come into the world, okay, we're falling, and then we've got these, in, these desires and temptations, these wants that aren't good for us, that's uh, opposed to the will of God. Uh, so we're drawn to things and we sin, okay? Now, when we sin, you know, it's not like, oh, you know, you, you just committed a sin. It's, it's more serious than that. Not only in the way that we, we have rebelled against God, but now that we have sinned, um, we have now changed. Every, every time you do something, let's say for the first, first time when you're doing something that's called soul searching or a moral indecision, as you're growing up, you're tempted. You got somebody says, "Hey, uh, you want a cigarette? Hey, you want to smoke a marijuana joint? Hey, uh, you want to get in the back seat of the car? You know? Hey, do you want to do this? Now we got what's called these, the these times of what we call great moral indecisions upon us, and so we can either, you know, give in to our temptation, uh, or we can resist it." Now, once we cave and give in to our temptation and we sin, it actually changes us, okay? Uh, and it, it changes us for the worse in the fact that that, in the, that that temptation will never affect us the exact same way now that we've made our first initial decision. Once you cave in on, a, say, a, a sin or a temptation, and the next time that sin or that temptation is presented to you, it's going to be easier now. It's not going to be a great, uh, usually a moral uh, conflict. It's going to be easier to engage in it. Or the same way, if you resist that sin, if you resist that temptation, the next time it comes, it's going to be a little bit easier to resist. So it can go either, fall either way. So we're fallen creatures. We have temptations to sin. Uh, once we uh, uh, start caving in against our better judgment, we know that it's wrong. It's inherently, uh, say, a moral. It's morally wrong. It's against the will of God. We cave in. We are changed. We and Kenneth Keefley is a major theologian at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. That's at Wake Forest, North Carolina. And he explains how this stuff changes us in the fact that it affects our will, uh, what's our free will. And he talks about our free will in two ways. We've got something called freedom of responsibility. This may be the first time you've heard of some of this. Freedom of responsibility simply means that we are the agent, we are the agent that is making the decision. We're not being forced to make a decision. We are that one agent that does it. And so uh, that, since we have freedom of responsibility, we are either moral. We're either morally culpable, uh, or we're morally praiseworthy. And then you have one other kind. This will be real quick. It's called freedom of integrity. And this is the one that gets damaged through sin. Freedom of integrity is the freedom to consistently do what you know is the right thing to do. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to be morally responsible for each and every action we take, for every sin we commit. And the more we do that, he says, the more of our freedom of integrity seems to be lost. So the, that's the, so that your ability to do the right thing, the freedom to do what is right, is getting lost along the way. And he says that this is comparable to when the Bible talks about people's hearts hardening, particularly like in Hebrews. It talks about people resisting God, they're hardening their hearts, that their hearts are being hardened. So the, the, the thing is, uh, you, you end up sinning, you're getting worse, and you're losing more and more of your freedom of integrity. Uh, which is your freedom to do what you ought to do. So, you know, it has, I don't know, it's been brought up in, you know, in conversations before, 
this whole idea about free will, because there's a lot of different views on, on free will, and this is more of a different take on, on free will. I think everybody would agree that we have free will in the sense that we are all responsible for our actions, our choices, right? We're the ones making it, even if it's a bad choice. Even if you're addi so addicted to drugs that you can't resist taking them anymore, uh, that you're so totally enslaved to it, you're still morally responsible for each and every time you're taking that. And, but that, so think of somebody who has taken drugs, they've got addicted, and, and now they're just totally enslaved to their addiction. Okay, so they have their freedom of responsibility. You don't really lose that. But what we do lose is what's known as this freedom of integrity. We lose it in, in the fact that we're, we're not free to um, do it, consistently do the right thing anymore. We're gonna, we've lost that ability. Now, the difference in, now let me try to explain freedom of integrity a little bit more to help you understand it. You know, we talk, we've talked before, you know, well, are we gonna be free in heaven? Do we gonna have free will in heaven? Can we sin in heaven? These kind of hypothetical questions, but they, you know, very, very real in theory there. But when we talk about somebody being in heaven, they're not going to sin because they're going to have full freedom of integrity. They're going to be free to do what they ought to do. Freedom, the right thing to do. Okay. And so, um, but here on this earth, we just we don't have that freedom of integrity to a full amount, but we can gain it back, Dr. Keithley says. And even if you don't accept the notion of freedom of responsibility, freedom of integrity, what I'm leading to is most people do agree on, and that's how do we get this, how do we get out of this trap? You know, I'm thinking of adults. Say they were, didn't grow up in church, uh, di didn't get saved, uh, they've been addicted to drugs, been addicted to pornography, addicted to gambling, all of this bad stuff, okay? And they're enslaved to it, okay? And then they get saved, okay? So, you know, what happens? How, does, how do these people start being sanctified? How do they start conforming their life to the will of God? And it's, for these people, it's hard. It's really hard for these people. Now, sometimes God does a miracle in their life and you know, it's like they don't, you know, they're, they're clear of drugs. They don't never take another drug. They don't ever smoke another cigarette. And they don't ever have a desire. They don't have any withdrawal symptoms or anything. There are people like that. But that's usually not the norm. Uh, people still deal with uh, some serious temptations after they're saved. And so we got to say, so how do we get, get them on the road to sanctification? How do we get them on the road to where they can, they can uh, uh, start getting on a trend instead of going down. They're on a trend to doing the right thing, conforming their life to Christ, conforming their life to the will of God. And that's where we're going to talk about the spiritual disciplines. Okay. Now let me flip over here. So I'm over here on page uh, 281, 282. Okay. Now we can't simply will ourselves to be spiritually mature. I can't sit here and go, I'm going to will myself to be spiritually mature. I can't do that. It's no more than I can will myself. I don't play the piano. Can I sit here and go, I'm going to be a great piano player. As soon as I get done here, I'm going to go play a masterful masterpiece. You can't do that, right? That's not something you can do by sheer will. But you can become a good piano player through what? Through practice, okay? And any other, so there's a lot of things that we cannot do by direct effort, and spiritual maturity is one of them. We just can't will it. So, but the, God has given us a way that we can uh, attain these things it's usually slow and it's usually incremental, but he's given us what's called the spiritual disciplines. So the spiritual disciplines are things that we can do by direct effort. I can pray by just sitting here and I, I can do that. I have that ability. I can pray. 
Uh, I can read my Bible. That's something I can do by direct effort. So you do the spiritual disciplines, and they help you to achieve the things that you cannot do by direct effort, such as spiritual maturity, you know, and all that spiritually healthy and all of that. So does everybody kind of follow where I'm at? The, this is the main thing is the way God gets us back on track towards this progressive sanctification to become more Christ-like. So, uh, and I've got quotes by, you know, Dallas Willard and Donald Whitney where they talk about they've written more, you know, on spiritual disciplines that I can ever read. Uh, and uh, they all talk about this same thing about these are the means that God has given us in order to attain spiritual growth and Christ-likeness, okay? And we have touched on spiritual disciplines in here. Justin, as we said, did an entire series for their Sunday school class. And uh, uh, so I want to talk about those right now. Let me just give us a little space. I'm going to leave the little pyramid up here. So what are some spiritual disciplines that are going to help us to start growing and maturing spiritually? Okay, so solitude. Reading and studying the Bible. Okay, so I'm going to put Bible here. Okay, uh, can you elaborate on that? A little bit. Just try to. Are you trying to? You're trying to start new habits. And I used to go there. I don't go there anymore. Okay. That might be. Okay. I used to say that. I don't say that anymore. Okay. Okay. We'll put it just habits. Okay. Prayer. And. Uh, pardon. Fasting, yep, that is. There's not, there's not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of them. Uh, you see them done in, you know, the Bible doesn't refer to them as spiritual disciplines, but it does refer to these things either directly or indirectly. It does refer to people by either by example or by... Uh, it being mentioned in Scripture, being addressed in Scripture in some way. Worship. Okay, worship. So now these are mostly activities that you're doing in private. But now with worship, you're now involved with others as well. More of a this is more of a corporate spiritual discipline that you do with others. Okay, worship. So this would include not only. Not only, you know, what we call praise and worship, but the entire service, attending the entire church service would be part of this as well. Um, it's a um, fellowship, you know, being around other believers, having fellowship. It's kind of like what, to piggyback on what Bill was saying, you know, uh, when I, you know, I used to have fellowship at the bar, uh, now... Instead of that, I go to the church and have my fellowship there. Um, okay, serving. It's a good one. And that, boy, takes on a lot of different ways there. You can list 100 different things or more under serving. But that's a good, just, just a real good category. That's getting up, doing, doing something to help others, to minister to others. So... You, know, you remember uh, Jordan was talking about the head, the, the heart, and the hands, and that sort of thing, right? Well, these uh, uh, spiritual disciplines also influence those parts of us. Our, our intellect uh, would be the head, our, our values, our affections, our heart, and then our um, behaviors is, is our hands. And so these, you can have them, a lot of times they'll overlap, but, you know, uh, serving is a great one that... That's going to help with the hands, with obedience and behavior. Uh, you get into things like Bible reading and prayer. That's, that's going to affect two things. One, one, it's going to affect the head. You're going to have knowledge now about God, about Christ. 
but it's also going to affect your heart. Okay, it's going to affect your affections, your values, um, as well. So, so these spiritual disciplines, you know, a lot of times they'll overlap. Some of them can influence all three, head, heart, and hands. But as we engage in these spiritual disciplines, these are kind of the means that God has given us. This is how we place ourselves on the operating table before the Holy Spirit so he can work on us. So if you want to have, if you want to be cured, let's say you're a, you're a drug addict, okay? You know that you can't cure yourself. Uh, you know you can't resist drugs, but you can check yourself into a rehab clinic and uh, submit, submit to the, I don't know what, what, if it's a psychologist or whomever it is, that you're working with in drug rehab, you're submitting yourself to them that, so that they can help you. In this case, uh, if you're sick, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna lay down on the operating table so the surgeon can work on you. We need the Holy Spirit working on us. So these are the means through which we place ourselves in a position for the Holy Spirit to work on us uh, and transform us from the inside out, generally speaking. Is how we look at that. Um, the, like we've mentioned before that some of the major ones to start with for a new believer or a young believer, or what? What spiritual disciplines? Prayer yeah, prayer and Bible study are two two big ones. Uh, and yeah, so getting into a church, looking for a church. Uh, one that you can preferably join, become a member of. Uh, so uh, that's a, a very important one. So, and then you can add, and somebody that's a new believer is not going to know about all of these, obviously. Uh, but as they start to be discipled, they can begin to engage in these spiritual disciplines. So these spiritual disciplines, you know, uh, it, it's kind of like, you know, when I say it puts us in a position for the Holy Spirit to work on us, remember Zacchaeus, not the song, but the, the actual guy that climbed up in a, was a sycamore tree? Or, okay, so he put himself in a path, right, so that Jesus could see him, recognize him. He didn't know all that was going to happen. He didn't know Jesus was going to say, come on down, and I'm coming to your house. But he placed himself in a position uh, where Jesus could actually see him uh, and even communicate with him. Uh, and we want to place ourselves in a position where the Holy Spirit is going to work on us but through conviction, through transformation, and all of these things, conforming us into the image and likeness of Christ. These things help, and, and Keith Lee says that, and not only Keith Lee, but uh, Dallas Willard and uh, Wayne Grudem, some great theologians, they say also that when we, when we engage in our spiritual disciplines, not only is the Holy Spirit working on us to transform us into, into the likeness of Christ, uh, but it also restores to us the ability to do what as we ought to do. So we're gaining this measure of freedom of integrity back. Now they call it different words, but they, uh, they say that this generally means that God uses uh, to, help, to help us to be obedient followers of the will of God. So we're, it's like we're getting back this freedom of integrity to do as we ought to do. And when we get to heaven, we will be what's known as completely sanctified. Okay, that means we will not sin. We will have complete and total freedom of integrity. You know, so uh, here on this earth, people think of freedom as the freedom to do what you want to do. That's how a lot of people think about it. And uh, that's not genuine freedom. The best freedom is the freedom to do as you ought to do, not what you want, because our wants are twisted and contorted and perverted. Our wants and our desires are as depraved sinners. So that's why we can't you know, just follow our heart. Uh, we, so anyways, um, and you know, to say that it's a limitation, well, isn't that restricting my freedom? You know, it, well, that, that's a good kind of freedom to have. It's not a negative kind of freedom, okay? 
Oftentimes, in American society especially, people think they should be absolutely free. I want to be free to do anything that my heart desires. Anything that I want to do, you know, they'll say, oftentimes they'll say, you know, as long as I don't hurt somebody, kill somebody, I need to be free. And again, I explained that's, that's not a good way to think about freedom uh, because basically that's just saying, I shouldn't I have freedom to sin any way I want to sin? Um, but being limited to, do, to be free to do as you ought to do is not a negative, that's a positive. Um, we can, God is even limited by this freedom because God cannot sin, God cannot lie. You know, God, uh, so is that a negative? Kind of like thinking, you know, God yeah. can't do stupid stuff. Yeah. You know, he's incapable of doing stupid stuff. Exactly. So, so that's not a negative. That freedom will be ripped yeah. away from us in heaven. No more stupid stuff. Sorry. You know, <laughs> that's a good point. I demand freedom. <laughs> you know, it's like, freedom. I want yeah. to, whatever, you know. I think salvation adjusts your freedoms. I think mm. freedoms are different. Okay, go ahead. Right. Go ahead. I think that my freedom to do what I choose to do yeah. may be sinful, may be wrong in this life. But salvation adjusts those freedoms. Suddenly, those freedoms are not the freedoms I desire. My freedom is over here now. Now I desire to do this. I desire to do that. I want the freedom to do that. And these things here now okay. are restrictors. They're not freedom. <clears throat> yeah, but people those still things, sin, Bill. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, even though people are saved, they still sin. Yeah. Is the only thing I'm getting to. Freedoms, yeah. yeah. Uh, we are changed immediately. Let me bring it. Yeah. What Bill's saying is, is I agree that we are changed upon our, upon our conversion. There is a change that happens, and it's called regeneration. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but that does affect affect us, as what you're saying, Bill. It does affect us in that there will be a change in an individual, in that in that um, he will be receptive and have a desire to do the right thing. Yeah. That scripture, I yeah. That the of the mind. yeah. Yeah, but we as Christians, until we get to heaven, we will still sin, um, and we, but with the entire, I guess you'd say, sinful nature is not totally eradicated until we get to heaven, so we will sin, but there will be a difference, and there will be an immediate difference, um, but progressive sanctification, conforming into the image and likeness of Christ, is often a, a slow process. Uh, some it, it can be a different speed for different people, and I think as I get older, serving Christ, I think yeah. temptations become irritations. Okay. You know, which things that at one time would have been temptation, today it's an irritation, and uh, I think that's what sanctification is all about. Yeah. And yeah. Speaking, yeah. Is that the things that were tempted twenty years ago, uh, they irritate you today, and and the more focus you on Christ, yeah, I think the more that becomes reality. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, but yeah, you're right. That's usually after you, yeah, if you've been saved for many years and you're older now. The the temptations are totally yeah, they're different in the way they affect you. They are different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, somebody, I didn't know if somebody was going to say something. I was kind of thinking about the the idea of. Freedom of integrity versus freedom of responsibility. And, um, when when you were describing that, what kind of came to my mind is like, you know, you've got like the a, a person has the capa- has has the capacity to, re- to to be both of those things. And while we're here on Earth, is probably some degree uh, it's it's it's, it's going to be some degree yeah. of a combination of both of those things. But depending on where you're how far along you are in your process of sanctification will, will be the evidence of how much freedom of responsibility you have mm-hmm. compared to how much freedom of integrity you have. Yeah, uh, there's a passage here that I, since we're on this, since we're on the subject that I, I'm going to give you a good, scripture, a good scriptural example to, to help. This is in Romans chapter 7, and Paul's been talking about the law, okay? And here in verse 15, Paul says, For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. 
He says, but if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. See that? The willing is present, but the doing is not. Uh, he says, um, for the good that I want to do, I, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I don't want to do. Um, he says, uh, but if I am doing the very thing that I do not want to do, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So this would be an example of Paul. He's got freedom of responsibility. He's the one that's making his choices, his decisions, and action, actions on it. But he's having trouble, what you call being 100% consistent in doing the right thing. He's talking about this, this principle. So anyways, Jesus said there at the Garden of Gethsemane, he wanted his disciples to stay up and pray with him for an hour. And they couldn't. They kept falling asleep. And Jesus was saying that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus was saying that in the context of not falling into temptation. So it does seem that there is this thing about us that even though we're saved, that even we have trouble, we can do the right thing, but say consistently doing it time and time again, 100% of the time, can be difficult. But as we grow in our progressive sanctification and in Christ-likeness, it does get better and better. Um, you know, so anyways, that is, um, kind of brings us sort of to our time, and I want to leave the floor, leave some time for, uh, you know, questions and comments and all of that. Um, there's a lot of different views on sanctification. A lot of denominations have different views on sanctification as well. You know, I think we mentioned it in here, like some of the holiness groups, the Nazarenes, um, believe that you can become perfected in this life where you never sin. There, are, you know, you have some some people like that even. So, and the and the way in which we grow in our sanctification, you know, some there are some that say, well, it's just it's automatic. Whether you do anything or not, it doesn't matter. You're going to become grow in sanctification in this life. Um, and so. Anyways, the, so I'm just kind of presenting this way that, uh, yeah, we're, we're expected to be transformed and conformed into the image of Christ after we get saved. And the, the means through which we are to participate in our sanctification is through the spiritual disciplines. It's the primary. The Holy Spirit works on us. Uh, it's, not, it's not as though we just say it's, all, it's not all up to us because the Holy Spirit is working on us. But, um, but anyways, does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Um, I know some of this may be new, may be difficult to comprehend, but... So again, back to the idea of the freedom of integrity and the freedom of... Responsibility. Responsibility. I, I'm, when you're, as you're describing and I'm viewing it like a spectrum, right? Um, is there a permanence to your state on that? Um, for example... Um, you talked about the idea of the depravity, and that it suggests that when we're, when, you know, when we're there, born, we have sinful nature. There can be a permanence to it. So, so that would suggest if, that when we're born, we start out um, on one end of that spectrum, right? And that, um, I guess maybe as we get older, maybe we accept Christ that puts us on a different, a different part of that spectrum. So. Um, as we make decisions, right or wrong, does that change where we're at on that? And if so, what are the what are the eternal um, consequences for where we're at with that? Well, I'll, I'll put it like this, Jake, because um, there's there's a lot in what you said. A Christian's uh, progression is generally it's. Let me try to draw just a little line for you to help. It's really it's, it's two different spectrums, right? So like freedom of responsibility, everyone in this room
room except one person chose what clothes you wore tonight. Joby, why are you in a pink shirt? Did you pick yeah. that? No, you didn't. It was what's wrong on your body. So that's that freedom of responsibility. She's wearing that because someone told her she's going to wear that. I'm wearing this because I want the boss to pick it out. So that's your spectrum on your freedom of responsibility is I get to, I'm responsible to wear this. I made this choice and I had the choice to make. She doesn't have the choice. Where the, res the responsibility of integrity is not only did I choose to wear a shirt, I chose to wear a shirt that does not have profanity on it and has all of the material necessary to cover my body parts. So not only do I have the freedom and responsibility that I get to choose what I wear, but I also chose to wear clothes that are modest and appropriate for the environment where someone else might have chosen to wear I don't know. I'm glad she still has on pants. <laughs> but if she walks in here in a in a shirt and a diaper, that's one thing. If I walk in here and choose to wear a shirt and a diaper, that's a completely different thing. But it's still that's where that freedom of integrity comes in, is that I, I'm also responsible for how honest and how my decisions ought to be, how close my decisions are to what they ought to be. That, did I say that right, Kenny? Yeah, so I, and, and I wouldn't worry too much about freedom of responsibility because, you know, that's about, if you're making a decision and a choice, you own it. Whether, whether you're, you know, unless somebody's holding a gun to your head. So that's all that is. You're just, you're, you're the one, you're the agent making the decision. Okay. But integrity comes into, do I have the ability to, to, to do the right, you know, the right thing? Am, am I losing it? The, but to touch on what you said, generally, a Christian over, let's say this is a timeline. This is the x-axis, and this is how many years. The y-axis is your sanctification. And so over time, you're going in an upward progression, become more Christ-like, but then there are times when a lot of times people fall back. You can call it being backslidden, or whatever you want to call it, uh, or lapsing. Then you go up, it's, it's very rare that you see just a straight up on anybody. Everybody has times in their life where they're, you know, they're going in an upward trajectory, but then they, we slide back. We, but so so that's what happens. What I is, is kind of the typical trajectory of sanctification. Now you were talking about can it have you know eternal consequences and all that. Well. Yeah, it, it can. The Bible talks about people that harden their hearts. Over and over, harden their hearts. And God turns them over. I, it's, it talks about in Romans to a reprobate mind. Where they resist God, they resist God, they resist God, and God lead, then God leaves them alone. Okay? So those people that do that, there are those eternal consequences. Um, but, you know, uh, but that's dealing with an unbeliever there. Um, but believers, yeah, there's, there's issues attached to our sanctification. I guess you could still talk about, um, rewards, eternal rewards, that sort of thing in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ. Um, but I don't, I don't know if I've really hit on exactly what you wanted me to hit on, but. The culture also plays a big part in this, because it's like the person that Jordan was talking about baptized during India while he was there. Uh, it does. The freedom that guy has versus the freedom we got is so different. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, the, the, all these things, when you start looking at that picture, yeah. it's totally different than what we deal with here. It is. And, uh, and I would say God takes all that into account. And, uh, yeah, so. Since we can't even find um, that way, we can't even imagine what he had to go through. Exactly. I agree. Yeah, totally. So, you know, the, so the main takeaway, I'll just kind of conclude here. And, you know, the main takeaway is we, we, we need to grow into Christ likeness. OK. And, you know, it, it appears that the best means that God has given us to do that is to participate in spiritual disciplines. OK. 
like I said, prayer, read your Bible, attend a church and fellowship with other believers, and those other things as well as you go along. So, um, you know, some of the other things uh, that are that are used, some of the theologians used to explain how it's all working. You don't have to worry about that, but just think about, yeah, we, you know, we got we're, we're a sinful person. We get saved. Yeah, we're regenerated. Uh, maybe. Jordan or Justin or somebody do a series on what that means to be regenerated. It's too much to talk about in here right now, but that affects you. That's going to affect you, your uh, your your will, your wants, and and things like that. And uh, but we, you know, God does doesn't say just sit there, you know, and I'm going to sanctify you. Our progressive sanctification, uh, we have to participate in that with and. Um, now, our positional sanctification is already completed. That's completed in Christ. That's the righteousness of Christ, you know, that's imputed to us, by which we're justified at our conversion. So, uh, I don't know, is there anybody, anybody else have any thoughts or questions of any I mean, kind? One thing, Brad, especially people in this room, the kind of takeaway is that, okay. man, there's always more. We can always, we can, yeah. every person in this room, myself certainly included, I can grow significantly between now and like the end of the year. There's always more. You know, we're not, none of us are, you know, are fully sanctified, and we can always yeah. be more Christ-like. And it would really surprise us how much more we can even, as you know, this is the adult class. You know, we're we think I have mature. Um, you know, yeah. But we and, and you think about the upcoming year. You know, 2023, we can really erupt in our every person in this room. So different this time next year if we want to be, you know. And so I mean, that's just, we just need to take that as a challenge. Yeah. That, um, that yeah, there's always more, and we can we can be twice as sanctified, yeah. you know, than what I that we are right now. Um, and so you have to take that as a challenge. And don't look at it as you know I'm never going to be perfect. Look at it as man, there's always more, you know, that we can do. So um, you know, be excited about that and go after it. Yeah. There's. There's always room for growth, yeah, right? This side of heaven, we're never we're never going to become fully mature, fully sanctified on this side of heaven. And uh, but but that's the you know that's the subjective goal of the believer is is to be transformed, conformed into the image and likeness of Christ. And uh, so, anyways, um, anybody else before we uh, close with prayer, have anything? All right, let us pray.